GC Rad 1 here, Yamaha T-Dub Club, and today I'm going to show you a little tip, a little trick that I've been doing on my T-Dub ever since I've had the Ricochet skid plate on there. And yeah, you're probably thinking, oh, okay, I already have some sound dampener on my skid plate, but I'm not talking about sound dampener. I'm actually talking about protection from between the skid plate and your engine because you probably have seen you go out and ride, that front tire is gripping all kinds of stuff and it's just picking it up and throwing it over onto the top of your skid plate. But the problem is if you have all that debris on top of your skid plate and you get into a good section and you get into that skid plate and all those rocks and stuff are on top of your skid plate, then it's just like hitting the ground. So why do you even have a skid plate on your bike? So what I'm running is foam in between the skid plate and the engine in order to keep those rocks and debris from getting down in there. Now, what I have is an old piece of foam that's not quite the size that I need it, but it was doing the job. Uh, I was getting a little debris on the sides, but it would typically bounce out, but it wasn't getting down in there where it was too critical. Although I did, find a rock that was large enough and it was kind of sitting there and, and, and rattling on the skid plate between the engine. I'm like, oh, that's not good. And uh, I've often debated on buying the larger foam and I just didn't know, I, you know, you get lazy, you riding, yada, yada, yada. But I actually found my other foam because I had three bags of this stuff and uh, I only had one when I was getting ready to do it and I couldn't find it. But because I moved and <laughs> tore my garage apart, I found all kinds of stuff. So now I have it, and then, you know, the bike just hit 10,000 miles, so I'm like, all right, now's the time to do it. I gotta tear this thing all apart anyhow, get ready for our ride coming up, up in Fort Payne at the Little River Adventure Company. And uh, so yeah, time to get my bike prepped. And so now it is. So I will show you as the bike sits, I'll show you the details in there now, show you kind of what I'm talking about, but we'll drop the skid plate, assess that foam, either add to it or take it out and replace it entirely. But I didn't buy the new skid plate foam. I think Moose makes it, Tusk makes it. There's a couple of different, and you may be able to just find it wherever, just any kind of foam to keep that rocks and debris from getting down in there. So my attempt is I'm going to add foam further out all the way to the edge. Yeah, it's gonna suck because my foam is still yellow. I would much rather have black or maybe fluorescent pink, but I don't know if they have that. But uh, anyhow, if someone wants to send me a, uh, a black kit, that'd be awesome. I'll just turn around and do the whole job all over again. But today, I'll, I'm gonna, well, let's get right into it and I'll show you what we're talking about, all right? Now, you can see the yellow foam down there and that keeps those rocks from getting way up inside there. But what I actually want is I want the foam to come all the way out to the edge um, and prevent any rocks from getting down in there. Uh, I'll have to put another camera angle on here but right here is where you could see a rock was sitting right between there, the case and the skid plate, and was just kind of jiggling around and just waiting for me to hit something to do further impact. But yeah, that's, that's what's got me fired up to get after this again. So here's where that rock was sitting, and you can see how it kind of burred up the skid plate right here, but that's the evidence that a rock was sitting there and it was in between the skid plate and usually when I come back there's all kinds of rocks all in this area here so yeah this is why I want to bring that foam out I want to bring it out all the way along this edge back here and uh, we'll see what happens up here I don't I don't know but yeah you can see how the little t-dub here it's a uh, it's taken on its fair share of damage because I ride it and I like to uh, kind of go for it here and there. But uh, yeah, all right, so let's, uh, let's drop this skid plate and get into it and see what we got going on. And uh, yeah, the engine does look like it's showing no oil, but it does have oil in it. If you lean the bike 
or stand the bike straight up, it'll come back over. But yeah, we'll get into that. We're gonna be changing that oil anyhow. As you can see, the skid plate's taking some pretty good hits. Actually gonna have to file that little piece off. But the skid plate has taken some good hits. I use it. It's like a rally car. If your skid plate's not touching the ground, you're too high off the ground. You might want to do a little penetrating lube on these bad boys back here. I think if they were to strip on you though, you would be able to uh, just rotate the skid plate down. And I pre-flight checked these for the video because I didn't want you to see me struggling. But uh, also too, when I put the skid plate on, I think I put some anti-seize lube on these bad boys because I've done this a few times. Not on this bike, but other bikes in the shop. Well, actually, yeah, my other bikes. But this is the first time this skid plate has came loose. So this skid plate, it's got eight or 9,000 of the 10,000 miles that I just hit. And that's kind of what I was saving this whole job for. And uh, I will tell you, putting skid plates back on can be a tedious task because they're not typically straight like they were when they went in. So yeah, I'm usually getting myself in the trouble. Actually, what we may do is we may just practice what I preach and just drop the front. The whole reason we're dropping this skid plate today is to get to this foam right here. I added this foam in order to keep rocks from getting in between the skid plate and the engine case because that's what happens. As you guys know, that front tire picks up a lot of debris and throws it over into the top of the skid plate. And what I wanna look at is how much foam do I need to cover the whole width? So I'm like eight and a half inches on the rear, about 10 inches up here. And uh, this is probably gonna be a, just work this out a couple of times and see what, what we have. But this old piece of foam right here has uh, probably seen better days, but it has done its job in protecting my bike. But the old skid plate, can use a little additional cleaning. All right, let's do that. You guys know I love this stuff. Simple green. Yeah. Okay, we're coming down. Give this bad boy a little cleanup job. And I, yeah, I see a good, a good hit on that little side over there. All right, well, let me get this thing cleaned up and then we'll get into step two. You can see this is a, a pretty well used skid plate. That of course is normal, but when you see that all up there, that's from running those rally gravel roads. And yeah, you can see it's a, it's a kind of a used skid plate. And look at that nice little curvature there. I think I may go put it on the press and try to put a little straightness back into it. And there's a good hit right there. And a good hit right there. And a good hit right there. Lots of good hits right there. But yeah. All right, that nasty burr on the skid plate, I'm just gonna give it a little filing down. The, uh, the shrapnel side of something I scraped, it just kind of lipped it up. So yeah, just giving a little deeper. It's like that's the thing, trophy truck guys to rally car guys. There was the aluminum skid plates and then WRC cars started going to carbon Kevlar and then uh, poly 
polypropylene, poly, poly some type of plastic skid plate. And the trophy truck guys started using it. You could see that it was like cinched down and it would warp all up and droop and it just didn't look clean. And trophy, you know, all your truck guys are super traditionalist. But I, th I think the new, new form plastics are so much better these days. A lot of the motorcycle companies have actually gone to a uh, polypropylene, poly some kind of plastic skid plate that's all formed. And A, it slides over the rocks better, and B, it doesn't have the noise reflection that everyone talks about with the 2W200 skid plate. So I got, got it cleaned up. Since I have everything out, I think we need to do an oil change. That's kind of what we're doing here. Getting ready to go to the uh, event this next weekend. I need my bike and tip top ready to go shape. I don't know if any of you guys have actually read my, why you need to do a skid plate first, but you can see right here, front of the engine case, this is before I got my skid plate, right when I got my bike. And I hit a good rock right here. And that's what made the uh, case start leaking. And I had to take the case off, do some shaving, and make it all seal back up. And I was super stoked that I didn't have to buy a, a new side case. I got lucky. That was my warning sign. So now, that's why I'm pretty religious about running a, a proper skid plate all right here she is leaking the oil down and you can see it's pretty dark and uh i run the little baby hard i mean it ain't like black black but and that's where i say like i know it recommends every thousand miles to change the oil but if you changed it every 500 it's not gonna hurt it's actually just going to be that much better. And, you know, every time you change the oil in this thing, it just runs so smooth that first couple hundred miles. So, I know it'd be excessive to change it more than 500, but think about race guys, man. They change it after every race. But, bad boy's pretty clean. 10,000 miles, yo. She's looking good. Can't be mad at that. And 10,000 miles and no valve job. It might get a valve job check, but right now, you hear how good she sounds on the videos. She got no clacky clack. But, that all has to do with this up here. The air box, that's gonna be next. While I'm letting the oil drain out, for this uh, 10,000 mile mark round, I'm going to use the good stuff. I've used it before. Yamalube SAE 1040 4T engine oil, full synthetic, high performance motorsports oil from Yamalube, Yamaha brand. It's overkill. But it's your engine, not mine. Um, I'm also going to put a new filter in. And I'm actually replacing the O-rings at the oil filter and the drain plug. So, hey, it's just, just nice little things to do to your bike when it hits 10,000 miles. You got to pamper it. Make it nice. All right. And, you know, this is the type of stuff that keeps it running on the regular so take care of your bike, take care of your bike, take care of your bike, and it'll take care of you out in the woods in the middle of nowhere. The last place you want your bike to be getting mad at you is in the woods, way, way far away with no cell reception. So take care of your bike. You don't have to use these products, but take care of your bike and just do your preventative maintenance. Okay, carrying on. Bust out this oil filter. Patience, patience, take your time. Don't be in a rush. Don't do the job if you don't have the patience. Don't rush the job. Only time you should be rushing in this type of environment is in race conditions, but 
that shouldn't apply for the T-Dub. He might be. Our, our buddy in Russia, he's he's racing him. Herzberg. Maybe he's in Germany? Austria? I think the Herzberg Rodeo is in Austria. Oh, filter looks good. Always note which way it comes out. There's a finger. There's a finger on the cap. Finger goes in the filter. This side's closed, it won't go in. So it's gotta flow the proper way. I like to wipe this area down and it's just another another area to check. See how see how she's flowing. See if any of the other debris coming in and around that filter. Yeah, it looks good. You can see right there. She's on the 10,000 mile mark and that's when I changed it last. That's how I kind of keep up with it. Even though everyone says you can find some way. I don't care if you change the filter or not, find a way somewhere to mark how many miles you've done. So that way you can be on your schedule. All right. Taking the old O-ring out. We'll put this new bad boy in here. And again, this is not every oil change that I do this. This is just hitting that 10,000 mile mark and uh, wanting to uh, make it freshy fresh. Noticed I kind of pre-lubed that ring up. You could dip your finger in the brand new bottle, but tis what it is now. New freshy filter. Sometimes guys will tell you to pre-lube these filters beforehand. It's not a bad idea. Just, it's just less, less oil that has to penetrate it before it gets, you know, when you start the engine up and you get a dry filter, the whole theory is if it's already pre-soaked, then oil, you know, you're just making sure that it flows instantly. Like that. It's not a multiple choice question on how the bolts go back in. The Allen head goes to the bottom. Long guy goes to the front, like notice the boss on the engine case. always fun when you take a whole side cover off and you're trying to remember which way the bolt patterns go. Sometimes you can take a piece of cardboard and just put a little silver mark on your engine case of where number one is and then just stick the bolts in the cardboard. Lay it that way you just counterclockwise I'll put an arrow on the board. You know when you're working in a shop and you're tearing like five or six bikes apart a day and then you're not gonna come back and work on those bikes until a week or two later. All this stuff kinda becomes a blur and you forget, man, what was I doing? It's one thing when you're working on your bike and you're just messing with it and you'll be back in a day or two or an hour or whatever, but when you're juggling a bunch. And notice I'm just going around and tightening all these a little at a time. Especially aluminum side cases, you don't tighten just one down and then go to the next. It's got to be a nice even torque all the way around. That should be good. All right, job done. Now we'll uh, get on to buttoning it up on the other side. All right, over here we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna remove the old O-ring off the oil cap. Freshy fresh. And the same thing, you gotta remember which way 
this bad boy came out. And if you take a look, the way the spring sits in the oil cap like that, it's not a, it's not a blocker like that. It's got a seal against there and actually catch it. That's the only way it's actually gonna screen the lube is to go like that. And this thing's always a tedious piece to put back in. I fear the day that I cross thread it. I've read so many blogs and posts about guys getting bikes and then they go to do the oil change and they strip the nut off and oil cap. I guess they are factory torque settings for this bad boy, but I've just done it by feel for so many years. So here we go. It's really all about keeping and then sometimes I'll just kind of break it back loose just to see where I'm at on it. You don't want it to fall out, but you don't want it so tight that you can't get it off next time. All right, you know, it's just one of those super delicate operations. All right. And maybe one of those things you just get your oil in there and then run it around and then check it. Make sure, make sure it's not too tight, make sure it's not too loose. All right, so from here, I guess we can put the oil back in. All right, getting ready to put the oil in, but uh, yeah, just kind of cracking up. Only you guys down here in the south will know what this is all about. Oh yeah, sometimes the old oil cap is uh, owned too tight. So what I'll do is I'll just take, and put a rag over it and grab it with the pliers. And then take it off, that way I'm not marring up my nice yum lube cap factory. See, it says, it says right there on the cap, yum lube. So, must be approved, right? It's time to put the lubricant into the bike. Carefully poke the toothpick. And I don't want to overfill the funnel to see it come out over the top of the engine case. But what I am going to do, so here's another thing that I learned. My, my buddy owns Subi Works down in Temecula, California. And Subi Works, he specializes in Subarus. And uh, so in his, in his shop, because California and all their rules and regulations and all this kind of stuff, all of his plastic containers, oil containers, have to be completely spotless. They actually, OSHA comes around and does the check, blah, 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 blah. And he has a five gallon bucket with holes drilled into the lid so that he can take all of his oil bottles and, and drain them out. But what was actually kind of cool is like, over the month or so of all the services that he does, that little bit of wall residual oil, he, he fills up a five gallon bucket over the course of, I don't know, three months, six months, or I don't, I don't know how long it is. But when I was there and I'm like, what's this all about? And he's like, well, I have to make sure that all my oil bottles are completely clean inside. So I'm like, oh, so you actually get that much oil out of there. So that's why I like this big funnel. I can put the can in there and now I'm going to go eat dinner and let that thing drain completely out. I mean, if you put expensive oil in there, you want to extract every penny out, right? So that's my little tip is get yourself a funnel that will actually hold the, the can and actually stay inside there without falling out. You just put it in there and set it and forget it and extract out every penny because in the i think it's like what one quart and a dab of a another so i'm gonna extract every ounce out of this all right i'm going to go eat dinner it's late all right i'm back from my dinner and a little dessert And 
Not a drop more to come out of there. So I think it's safe to say I've extracted every Bitcoin pennies worth of oil from this container. So yeah, ain't even no sense of leaving it up there anymore. And watch this, there's not gonna be any oil to leak from there either. So, all right, that job is done. Now we can, uh, oh yeah, we do gotta top it off. So I'll stand the bike up, check the oil. I may kick it over a couple of times and then add oil accordingly. All right. So when it's sitting on a side stand and you put the oil in there, it doesn't look like there's any oil in there still. I haven't cranked it up yet, but I'm standing the bike straight up and you can see it's between, it's actually on the high line or right where you want it to be. But I bet that if I crank it up and cycle the oil through the engine and the filter and all the crevices, we will have to add that little additional piece. WD-40, and that's uh, that's just natural. That's the way it's going to be when you coat your engine down with the WD-40 after the wash. It's better than uh, forming the rust spots. So just that little, it's just one of those little things. But listen to her purr. All right, does so that mean she's at their? Uh, Initial warms to start. And, uh, all right, we'll check and check and see how she's doing from there. And that's the, that's the difference we're going to have to add right there. You want to be at that top line. That's the low line. That's the full line. That's what we want. And if you guys want super clear, explicit instructions, then consult your owner's manual because all of these details are discussed in there. Oh, look at me. I didn't have my oil plug on. And we got a little spray residual. All right, we gotta add the difference anyhow. Life in the shop trying to film and do multiple jobs all at one time, right? I've topped it off just a little bit more. But uh, for a third time, once I get the bike down on the ground and get it to where I can stand it perfectly straight up against the wall or something, I don't have my lift set up yet to where I can chalk it in straight up and down. But uh, it looks pretty good from there, from what I can see, holding it up. Yeah, but I will check it for a third time once I uh, get it on the ground. So now we're gonna get into attempting to put this foam in here. And I can't tell from my old piece if it just got all smashed down or if I actually cut it in half. And I can almost imagine that I did cut it in half. But before I do that, I'm going to need to uh, kind of do a little trim trim to shape the outer shape that I want in hopes, in hopes that I can actually make this work. I want the foam to come all the way out to the edge of the skid plate so that way 
no rocks get in between the skid plate edges. So we shall see. I don't know exactly how I'm going to do. I think I need to cut this sucker in half. And I don't even remember how I cut it in half. I like to smash it down. It smashed down pretty good, but hey, always with the crazy projects. I'm sure the uh, skid plate foams that are on the market may actually be the right size, but how could they be the right size? They gotta be cut to fit. I'm not real sure. I'm just going on a theory and a and an idea. Who knows? I'm sure somebody's sitting there going, there's a much easier way to do it. There's always an easier way to do it if you're from that particular industry. But hey, you got to try and this looks to be like a very open cell foam. I guess, I don't know, 900 debates. So that's where the oil drains out. So that's going to be an interesting endeavor in the future if I have it all the way out there. But hey, we'll deal with that in 500 miles which may be real soon if we do a couple hundred miles this weekend. Da -da -da. Yeah, I'm trying to cut this out so that way I don't have to drop it every time. You know, the this, this skid plate has your drain, drain hole. And previously I was able to uh, drain the oil without removing the skid plate. But now with this extra extra going on I don't know all right well so something like that this thing's gonna be crazy to get back on here I'm sure I'm gonna have to put the rear skid plate up in there get the foam stuffed in there and then somehow bring it up and try to get it bolted into place. I hear you guys laughing going, yeah, good luck with that, buddy. I got to try. And that we may just do the, uh, we may just trim it off as we get there. All right, well, I guess the only thing to do is, is Put some anti seize on these bolts if you ever want to get your skid plate back off. And obviously, my skid plate came off pretty good. Oh, this is the nervous time because getting skid plates back on, getting skid plates on is always a chore. I'll put some anti seize in there just in case I wipe half of it off, just trying to get the bolt in there. Let me pause for the cause. I don't know if I can. Get two threads and get it on. Oh yeah, there we go. All right, I like the thought of that. What I noticed earlier is that the skid plate bolts are not Allen, they're the star torques. Torques are actually stronger than an Allen head. Automotive Industries adopted it pretty well these last few years, but and I think the star, I think this little star nut, it's been around since the, I want to say the 60s or something. I looked it up and it's been around for so long, but it just hasn't been adopted the way you would think it would be. Well, I guess here goes nothing, right? Get in there, squishy, squishy. Oh yeah. All right. That 
part's gonna work. Well, I'm just gonna get the front bolts. Maybe this tube smells so bad because it's just so old. Good old Permatex Anti Seize Lubricant. Header bolts, I don't know, any kind of bolts that are exposed to all the elements, but you actually want to try to get them out at a later date. But the anti seize is the is the way to go. All right, I know this is gonna look super hokey with the big yellow poking out, but guess what? That's where the big issue's gonna come in at. Yeah, sorry this isn't just a straightforward run and gun as you go kind of thing. But you get the idea. I'm going to get this foam up here so that way nothing can get into that skid plate. And it's probably gonna look like a horrible mess once it gets dirty, but I'd rather, I'd rather not look horrible, but this may be just the uh, inspiration I need to just go by the proper foam. And that may be coming sooner than expected because this foam here seems to be dying us fast death. It's breaking down. Yeah, this, this old foam is old. And this may be the scenario where I just start dropping down the skid plate to do the oil changes. There's the basic concept, but is it going to work? That's the 32 cent question. I think it'll work for intended purposes. It's not pretty, but what I do like about this already is you know this section above your uh, skid plate where the frame comes down, there's this big gap that allows all kinds of stuff to get down in there. I need something to cover this area here. It's like I need a little rally mud flap. This frame is showing the same kind of signs of abuse as the uh, skid plate is from the gravel. See, I told you I was old school. I have a ratchet, but I didn't grab it. I went for the wrench instead. All right, I'll cinch that down, but I'll, uh, huh. Okay, well, it's not, it's not pretty by no means with that yellow on there, but for the intended purpose that we're going for, it actually is going to work. So this will probably get me to buy some black foam so that way I can foam discreetly. People won't be going, hey man, your, your, your bike is uh, spilling its guts out. I don't know, we'll see what all kind of humorous things you can say about my yellow foam. But now the rocks aren't going to get inside the skid plate there. There's the frame that comes down and there was that area that gets in between. Mainly on the other side, it's more important because there's some, it hangs out more where the rocks could get in there on, on the, uh, the case. And if you do hit that edge, with those rocks sitting on the inside. It's, it's uh, more vulnerable on the passenger side of the bike than the driver side, so that's four-wheel drive speak for you. Passenger, driver, if you're ever out rock crawling or whatever, you can holler out passenger or driver and that'll always tell the driver which way to turn the steering wheel. Passenger or driver, it's just a little thing you learn hanging out with a bunch of rock crawlers. All right, so it's gonna work. It's not pretty but it's gonna work. Now I need some black foam. Now I'll have to uh, remember those measurements and uh, get one solid piece. But the thing is now is I will have to uh, drop my skid plate in order to do the oil change, but that's not bad on the front there. Just loosen those guys on the front. We'll loosen them a little bit on the back. 
well, drop these on the front, loosen them on the back, and get it down and get in there. But also, too, <laughs> that, that cap's not coming out. You're not going to lose it. All right. Well, enough of that. We'll, we'll go from there. Yep, got the Ronald McDonald style going on. That's just my red lift and showing it off. But if you didn't see the red, then it's just yellow and black. But anyhow, now the foam is all the way there. There's no rocks that are going to sit on there too much. And uh, I don't know. I'm, uh, I'm happy with the functionality of it. I'm not happy with the looks. But at least it's a traditional Yamaha speed blocks colorway with the yellow and black. I would much prefer a black foam, but the function is the fashion, right? All right, so there it is. You know, maybe this foam should sit up in here more. I, I don't know. This will just be a trial run. I'll see what happens this weekend and we'll see how it goes. But there it is. All right, getting ready to put the oil in, but uh, yeah, just kind of cracking up. Only you guys down here in the south will know what this is all about. Oh yeah, I think I hear him. Oh yeah, yeah, I can hear him. Tree, yep, tree my dog. All right, let's go. So, <laughs> I grew up, I grew up in the state of Alabama. I got out of here at age 17. But in those 17 years, I did some coon hunting with my uncle. And uh, this was like, I don't know, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 years old through those ages. And uh, yeah, you'd be sitting on the side of the road out in the woods and you're trying to listen to which way your dogs ran. And, and the coon hunting dogs will let out two types of bark. He'll, he'll give a bark for trailing and a bark for tree and there's actually coon hunting competition and uh, I had a really really good pup that my uncle went all the way to I think it was Tennessee to get this dog and uh, she was a good little walker that's why I'm a walker fan because we hunted with walkers but man this dog would hunt and uh, she had a good bark that I knew and I was out there hunting in these competitions with these older men and uh, I did really good. I qualified for the world's hunt back back when I was a kid. But uh, yeah, you're sitting on the side and you got to listen for your dog out there and be like, yep, all right, trailing. And, and when you're cooning hunting, you'd get scored on the card. Uh, you know, first person to, to call trailing and then first person to call tree, but then when you go down and then if there's no coon in the tree, then you get those points all against you. But if there is a coon in the tree, then if you're the first to call, second to call, third to call, then that's how, it's, it's, that's how it was scored. I don't know how it is these days. I don't even know if they're doing that kind of stuff anymore. But uh, yeah, I, I grew up <laughs> just mobbing pretty much through a lot of the same woods that I'm in these days riding the moto uh but yeah coon hunting was uh, a, a a kind of big part of my life at that time and uh, if you don't believe me take your take your funnel and go outside and give it a listen and point that sucker in some different directions and it'll be interesting what you'll hear trust me but today we're gonna put the oil in the bike. Before men learned how to control fire and put it to work, it was man's greatest enemy. In much the same way, your emotions can be your own greatest enemy. Or under control, your emotions can make you healthier and happier. I think of fire in connection with emotions because when you become stirred up, your emotions control your actions. It affects not only yourself, 